there was a hunter in the woods who, after a long day hunting, was in the middle of an immense forest. It was getting dark, and having lost his bearings, he decided to head in one direction until he was clear of the increasingly oppressive foliage. After what seemed like hours, he came across a cabin in a small clearing. Realizing how dark it had grown, he decided to see if he could stay there for the night. He approached and found the door ajar. Nobody was inside. The hunter flopped down on the single bed, deciding to explain himself to the owner in the morning. As he looked round, he was surprised to see the walls adorned by many portraits, all painted in incredible detail. Without exception, they appeared to be staring down at him, their features twisted into looks of hatred. Staring back, he grew increasingly uncomfortable. Making a concerted effort to ignore the many hateful faces, he turned to face the wall, and, exhausted, he fell into a restless sleep. Face down in an unfamiliar bed, he turned blinking in unexpected sunlight. Looking up, he discovered that the cabin had no portraits, only windows. I'd actually seen him on our way home from school. He looked dirty and disturbed and stared straight at us as our bus went by. <laughs> we even made jokes about him, probably as our way of pretending we weren't afraid. He was incredibly out of place in our middle class suburb, so his mere presence felt threatening. Thus, our panic when the three of us got off at our stop and saw him at the corner, about to look in our direction. He was between us and our houses, and the bus had already pulled away, so we bolted for the bushes of a nearby yard. We weren't sure if he'd seen us, but we peered through the leaves and saw him stalking our way, <laughs> muttering randomly. Tim, my neighbour, insisted that he'd seen a large knife in the man's ragged clothing. Danny, a kid I hardly knew who had just moved into the neighbourhood, he insisted that he was imagining it, that Tim's glasses must have reflected the sun wrong or something. Still, we were terrified, and the sidewalk was going to bring him right by us. It was Tim that broke and ran first, keeping low. I followed, my heart pounding, as we dove into the darkness underneath the porch of the unfamiliar house we'd been hiding near. As we squeezed our bodies against the dirt, the grimy wood pressed into our backs, barely giving us enough room to breathe. From our hiding place, we could see the disturbed man turn into the yard in front of us and begin searching around, hitting the bushes and muttering angrily. I realised then that Danny wasn't with us, but I hadn't seen where he'd gone. Tim had lost his glasses back at the bushes and he just huddled in the shadows next to me 
in near blind terror. We stayed there in silence, waiting. Every so often, whenever I almost thought it was safe to come out, footsteps would creep across the wooden porch above us. Tim almost sneezed once, but I covered his mouth and nose in stark fear. We waited there so long that the tone of the sunlight began to change. We hadn't heard the man searching about in a while, and I was just getting ready to peek out when footsteps clattered and a thud hit the wood directly above us. A split second later, Danny's face appeared in front of us, upside down, and he looked at us through the lattice. A look of shock and surprised crossed his features at finally finding us. He whispered something, but I, I couldn't hear anything. He seemed to be saying, Come closer. So I figured the horrible man was still around, and we had to be quiet. And I inched forward. Danny's features grew fearful, and he kept indicating something above us. Strangely, I couldn't hear him. His eyes seemed to dim then, and I inched forward a little bit more. I froze for a moment in horror, then backed up. Tim mouthed me. What did he say? And I just shook my head, completely in shock. Danny hadn't conveyed, come closer. He had mimed, he's up there. The drifter was unknowingly sitting right above us, waiting, because he knew we had to be somewhere in that yard. There was nothing to do but wait in silence, trying not to scream. I was glad Tim had lost his glasses. I lay there as darkness descended, waiting in unwavering terror and trying not to feel the glassy stare of Danny's severed head as it rested in the grass a foot away. My grandfather was an inventor. All his life, he'd be tinkering with something, either taking something that existed and changing it, making it into something brand new, or very least different, or inventing something entirely from spare parts. While nothing he invented was ever earth-shaking, it was always one of my greatest delights ever since I was little to see what he'd make. Childhood visits to his home would always begin or end with me sitting on the couch, a look of absolute fascination on my tiny face as he showed off whatever gadget he'd put together in his workshop this time round. It was like having my own personal Santa who worked all year round to fill my eight-year-old mind with wonder and glee. My older sister was likewise excited, no matter how much she tried to hide the excitement it filled her with, probably in an effort to appear cooler or more mature than me. And while, because of real life getting in the way, the visits became fewer and fewer the older we got, we would always make time to see him at least a few times a year. And every time, he'd have something new to show us. He really was a genius. I should add that it isn't meant to imply something horrible happened to him. I'm sure some days he wishes it had, that it had been him who wound up in that hospital instead of my sister. But no, he went in his sleep. And I hope that 
his passing was a peaceful one. Even all these years later, I can't bring myself to be angry about what happened. I can't bring myself to hate him. He had no idea what would happen. No clue how things would pan out. He knew something was wrong. Oh yes. He wasn't some doddering old fool. He knew, the first time he looked through them, that something was wrong. But he thought it was something only a little odd. Something uh, unsettling and curious perhaps, but not anything dangerous. Not anything that would harm anyone. I think, deep down, he just wanted to know that he wasn't crazy. He wanted to be sure that he wasn't seeing things. You know, who can blame him? There were three of us that year. Myself, and my girlfriend Justine, and my sister Joan. We were both used to our grandfather being <laughs> bursting with energy to show us whatever he put together. So his oddly subdued mood when he came to the door to greet us came as a bit of a surprise. I was a little disappointed, in fact, as I'd been hoping Justine would get to share in the experience of having a new invention demonstrated before our awestruck eyes. We'd only started dating that year, so it would be the first chance she got to see the kind of things I'd been telling her about. The day passed pleasantly enough as we chatted, enjoyed lunch and watched the television together. I think it was Joan who asked him, finally, if he'd anything special to show us that day. We knew that he'd been working on something as while this was the first time we'd seen him in person in a while, we'd both spoken to him on the phone in the preceding months, and he'd eagerly explained to us that he was working on something he thought would be quite extraordinary. I couldn't tell you how he made them, nor would I if I could. Nor could I tell you what his original idea for those oddly coloured circles of glass had been, before that fateful day he'd looked through them and seen what he'd seen. He never shared details of his work with us beforehand, as he wanted it to be a surprise. And afterwards, I think he was terrified of the thought of anyone replicating what he'd made. All I know is that when Joan pressed him to reveal his latest invention, he looked nervous in a way I'd never seen him before. Looked as if he was deeply troubled by something. He hesitated before speaking as if not sure he should say anything at all, before explaining to us that the nature of what he was working on had changed after an unusual event and that he wasn't sure if it would be a good idea to show us the end result. Now, we may have grown since the days that we could perch on his knee, but whether someone is two years old or in their twenties, the surest way to make them want something all the more is to tell them they can't have it. So his reluctance, which at the time I'm sure we both thought was feigned, to heighten the suspense before the unveiling, it just made us both want to see his invention more than ever. With a little persuading, he agreed and left to fetch it. He came back a few moments later with what appeared to be a pair of glasses. With one big difference. The lenses were like no glasses we'd ever seen before. I can't even describe the colour of it without resorting to words like red-ish or greeny, as they didn't seem to be exactly any colour that we could have a name for. In fact, they didn't seem to be exactly any one colour at all, as if you tilted them one way, they would look different to you if you tilted them another. I know full well that probably sounds more like magic than something a well-meaning old man could put together in his humble little workshop. But there you have it. 
Joan asked what they did, and our grandfather paused for a few moments, as if not quite certain how to answer. In the end, he told us we really had to put them on for ourselves, as he was certain neither of us would believe him if he told us. Joan wanted to put them on first, but as she lifted them off the table, he reached out and grabbed her hand. He cautioned her that it might be startling at first, but that she wasn't in any danger, and that if she got frightened, she could just take them off. He warned her that what she was about to see may not make any more sense to her than it did to him, but that we were all there and that she was safe. I could tell Joan was a little frightened. She always was lousy at hiding how she felt for people. And even I was feeling a bit unsettled by our grandfather being so uncharacteristically ominous about the whole thing. Joan slipped the glasses on and we waited. She gasped and then for the next few moments she looked puzzled more than anything. Her lips moved wordlessly, and I thought I caught her. No, that's not right, under her breath, as she seemed to look around at something none of us could see. And then she began screaming. I don't know if you've ever heard someone scream in horror in real life. I can promise you this, it's not like in the movies. The movies do not convey the awful sound of someone you love screaming their lungs out, making a noise more like an animal than a human being. They cannot make you feel the things I felt in that moment, watching Joan yank the glasses from her head and hurl them across the room. And nothing could have prepared us for the sight of Joan beginning to claw out her own eyes, screaming louder than anyone should be able to scream as she did. When we had her pinned down so she couldn't hurt herself anymore, Justine and my grandfather held her that way while I called for an ambulance. I had to watch as she was strapped down and wheeled away into the back of one, thrashing and hissing and shrieking like some mad animal, like something utterly consumed by fear. I explained what had happened, knowing full well how it made me sound. Justine and I both explained the serious events that lead to this to the skeptical, if not totally disbelieving hospital staff, and then to the specialists called in when nothing short of being tranquilized proved effective at stopping my sister from trying to hurt herself while screaming like that. The glasses had supposedly gone missing, which made proving what had happened difficult. And it wasn't until almost a year later long after my sister had been committed, that my grandfather finally confessed to me that he destroyed them. I don't know if having them could have helped, could have given the doctor some way to make things right. I doubt it somehow, and I can't truly blame him for doing what he did, given that it was an act born out of guilt and an honest desire to make sure this didn't happen again. I asked him what my sister had seen that day, when he told me what he'd done. I asked what those glasses had done to her. He hadn't wanted to talk about it, and for the first time in my life, I'd raised my voice to him, angrily demanding to know, after all this time, just what had driven my sister to this state. What had affected her so deeply, so profoundly, that she was now no longer even recognizable as the person I'd grown up with. He took me to his workshop and began digging around through the bits and pieces that littered the place. The half-finished and now long-discarded inventions still awaiting completion. He produced two pieces of glass rather like the ones that had been fitted into those glasses. He told me that there wasn't any way to describe it without sounding insane. That if I had to know, then I had to see. But he begged me not to do this, that knowing wouldn't make things any better. 
he was right. I held the glass up to my eyes, and in an instant, everything changed. Instead of just my grandfather, stood before me now, there were dozens more in the room with us. But they weren't people. They were pale and emaciated, hunched over and dressed in dark clothing with black lips and wide, lidless eyes that seemed to almost bulge from their skulls in a manner both comical and horrifying all at once. Their mouths were full of hundreds of thin teeth, like needles. Their fingers were grotesquely long and ended in dark and viciously pointed nails that scraped along the floor as they walked. And all of them were talking, or rather, their lips were moving soundlessly. Each and every one of them was trying to say something that couldn't be heard. Dozens upon dozens of voices trying to convey something. I dropped the glasses to the ground in shock, and my grandfather brought his foot down on them hard, grinding them to powder beneath his foot, muttering that he should have done this in the first place. He put an arm around my shoulder, asking if I was all right. I was far from all right, and he'd been correct. What I had seen made things worse, not better. It took me a while to work it out, of course, why this had such a horrifying effect on my sister, and yet I'd survived the experience, frightened but not sporting the mental scars it had given her. The glasses only let me see the creatures. I couldn't hear what they were trying to say to me, couldn't understand the message they were trying to impart. But my sister was deaf. She could read their lips. Three years ago, one of my colleagues, whom I consider a friend, uncharacteristically stopped coming to work. Mr. Podevsky was in his forties and was well respected. Health-wise, he was a runner and in impeccable shape. He'd been working towards obtaining his master's degree, so I figured he most likely succeeded in taking a position elsewhere. I just thought it was odd that he didn't tell any of his lunch buddies goodbye or anything like that. Some of us had known him for 10 years. His empty chair at the lunch table often evoked questions of his disappearance. Hey, did Podevsky win the lottery or something? <laughs> Lucky prick doesn't have to work anymore. Does anyone know if Podevsky took another job or something? Did he die? What the hell happened to that dude? Nobody seemed to know anything. They knew what I knew. He never came back to work. I googled his name and found nothing. No social media presence. No criminal record. No newspaper articles. No obituary. Nothing. I literally ran into Mr. Podevsky yesterday as I was entering and he was exiting a gas station. As we shook hands, he appeared pleased to see me, but his eyes were dull and teary. Quite frankly, his physical transformation altogether was beyond shocking. He was thin three years ago, but has since lost a considerable amount of weight, which aided in accentuating the wrinkled skin that sagged like melted wax from his face and bones. His once groomed and lively brown hair had turned light gray, long and wet. Hey man, what happened to you? I inquired with a warm, cheerful smile. 
Now, Mr. Podevsky was a great listener, a sensible man who often gave profound advice on matters, but he was never known to be an elaborate storyteller. However, what he confessed to me outside this gas station yesterday had every hair on my body flaring. I haven't been able to think about anything else and usually nothing affects me. He said, Brandon, this is going to sound strange, but it's the horrible truth. I just smiled and shrugged, not really knowing what else to do. There was indescribable anguish in his tone and so much pain poured from his face while conveying the following. On the morning of December 4th, 2012, I was taking a shower before work, just like I do every morning. Well, I heard someone pounding on the bathroom door. Brandon, I mean really pounding. I could tell it was my oldest son as he began shouting, Dad! Dad! Let me in! I yelled back to him, Come in! The door shouldn't be locked. I finished as fast as I could. While rinsing the last of the shampoo from my hair, my son's voice echoed repeatedly throughout the bathroom, or maybe just in my head. I kept hearing, Dad! Dad! Let me in! Dad! Dad! Let me in! I dried off and got partially dressed. I went straight for his bedroom. And there he was, my 16-year-old son, nestled gently underneath his cocoon of covers, with his eyes closed. <laughs> I laughed a little as I said, You know the door wasn't locked. You could have just come right in. He didn't stir. I cleared my throat and made my voice more authoritative. Wake up, son. It's time to get ready for school. He didn't budge. He remained completely still. I got closer and shook his shoulder. He wasn't breathing at all, and his body was like ice. I sat and stared at my son for several minutes before calling my wife. He died unexpectedly, and honestly, Brandon, I've had a really difficult time dealing with it ever since. Mr. Podevsky paused. He used the bottom of his shirt to sop up the streams on his cheeks. I know my own son's voice, and I heard it loud and clear. I heard it not even two minutes before entering his bedroom. Yet the coroner said my son had been deceased for several hours. I stay awake because I know what waits. It is patient and I am powerless. I've had nightmares before, just like every child who snuck in a late movie or read that book that was just a bit too scary. A momentary rush of adrenaline as your mind jolts awake before you laugh at your imagination and settle back in for rest. Perhaps the truly terrifying visions last until the dawn when the sun fills you with courage and reason once more. This is different. My past nights have brought no rest, only the same message verbatim. The more I review what has been burned into my psyche, the more convinced I become. It is a message. It is for me to see through, but I cannot. I know what waits and what it wants. Each time I jolt awake, 
to the feeling of dewy grass brushing against my face. With my parting days long behind me, I immediately know something isn't right. I stand up and spin around, frantically examining my surroundings. Lush grass spreads out as far as can be seen in the dim greyness that blankets everything. Further than 50 feet can't be made out through the mists. In the centre of this field is a thick stand of gnarled trees that juts out sharply against the otherwise flat terrain. In all of this time, not a single sound is made. No wind moves the grass or the trees. No animals cry out. There is only a silence whose pressure matches the oppressively dense mists. And then, a phone rings. It is an old-fashioned ring rather than a song or modern chip-tune chime, and it comes from the jagged tree line loud enough for the sound to have a force that knocks me back on my heels. It's a phone call, so my first instinct is the social obligation to answer it. A phone represents either a timeline to reach out of here or some contact calling in. Both possibilities equally helpful. I start towards the trees and leave the clearing behind. I stay awake because I know what waits. It is clever and I cannot keep up. If the mists billowing about the clearing were oppressive, then the forest is claustrophobic. Gnarled limbs reach for me across the path. They never quite touch me but constantly threaten to. They stay just out of my way as I follow the siren's call into the trees. It doesn't take long to reach the base of one thick bare oak that stands out. The electronic warbling of the phone is coming from its roots where an old flip style cell phone sits. Its screen is cracked as though from a fall and there is a single large thumbprint pressed on the bottom two-thirds of the screen. But it evidently works. I press the green call button and bring the phone to my ear. The phone continues ringing. I flinch as the sound stabs into my ear and pull the phone away from my head. I look down and press the call button again, but I cannot stop the screeching tones. Becoming more and more frantic, I jab at every button on the phone, but get no different result. I need you to answer. My head snaps up to find the source of the speech. It stands a short distance away, no more than 10 feet. A looming figure, mostly shrouded in a dark cloak. Pale hands poke out of the baggy sleeves and wisps of white, curly hair stick out of the deep hood. On its feet are black boots suitable for warehouse work. The most off-putting feature though is its pair of blue jeans. Everything about the appearance says confused high schooler in need of an identity, but it, it just isn't that innocent. There is some sort of perversion in the air that just feels wrong. Its presence made the phone's pleading calls sharper and the silence between chimes heavier. I just need you to answer the phone. Its voice is deep, but not outside a human's range. Its tone is neither pleading nor commanding. It simply states what is. I didn't even notice that I hadn't stopped frantically smashing the call button with my thumb hard enough to begin bending the nail back. I didn't feel pain, only panic, and the need to get the phone to pick up. 
Why won't you just answer? I couldn't find a response. At some point, I'd fallen backwards into the roots of the tree and felt grateful for its strength at my back. I weakly tried to slide back with slack muscles and no breath in my chest. I stay awake because I know what it wants. It is patient and I can't be bothered. I always knew you wouldn't. You let me down. My desperate attempts did nothing for the phone and nothing for it. A deep, breathy sigh came forth from it and my thumb twitched against my finger repeatedly. There was no longer a phone. Stand. I did. What do you have? I blinked. Again, no response came to me as I looked around, confused. All that could be seen was the dead skeleton of wood mocking the life a forest normally houses. Where there was once flourishing beauty, there was now nothing. Correct. Look. It pointed up. I complied. In the intertwining branches above my head, there was nothing but clumps of dead, dry moss clinging to the limbs. The moss covered many of the branches on every tree that I could see. It hung down to just above my head and swung gently in a breeze that could not be felt. The phone started to ring again, but it was nowhere that could be seen. Your escape is there. It is the only way out. It has not moved since its sudden arrival. No shifting of weight from side to side and no hand movements to accompany its terse statements. Looking from it to the moss overhead, I saw no option and reached for the moss. Despite its dry appearance, it felt resilient. Running my hands over the strand I could reach revealed intertwined growths that overlapped one another to give support. They ran over each other in a spiral pattern that helped to spread the weight of the plant over several lengths. It felt like... It, it felt like rope. It is your only way out. You saw nothing here for you. The moss looped back around itself, back over the branch. A circle of it dangled before my face now, but that couldn't be right. Wasn't it just higher? This wasn't right. This isn't the way out. Isn't it? It just stood there. I held the moss in my hands, one on each side of the loop. I could see it standing on the other side, its hooded face encircled by the rope. I tried to think of another way to escape, for some reason not to try this. I had people I could count on to help me. I had things I was working on that could provide a path to freedom. Then where are they? I looked away from it. The uneasy feeling had gone from the air. I guess I just grew accustomed to it. It wasn't really that bad to begin with. I didn't have an answer to its question. This is your choice. I only offer once. Come with me. There was another way. There had to be. This wasn't the proper choice. Another way. Another way. Something. Somebody. You stand with your only friend at the gallows end. I slowly lifted my eyes and looked about. The oak tree was gone. The entire forest had receded and now surrounded us in a large clearing. We stood on a wooden platform. 
boards beneath my feet were brightly polished and fit snugly against one another. Where the tree was once at my back, there now stood a tall wooden pillar. A beam replaced the branch overhead. From it hung thick rope in a place of the stringy moss. It still stood in the same position as before. Your choices brought you here. Don't you deserve this? I did deserve this. I had earned it. I slipped the rope over my head and looked back at it and smiled. It nodded. And to think, all you had to do was answer your phone. I fell quickly. And then I woke up. Last night was the first time I'd seen this much of the dream. On previous nights, I'd come to at various points before the end, but it played out exactly the same each time before I woke up. Last night, I knew I could never sleep again because the next time would be different. In checking the time on my phone after jumping awake, I noticed that I had missed calls. Three of them were from my best friend's number. One of them was several hours later from the local police. I stay awake because I know what waits. It is right. When I was a little kid, I used to go out back to my grandmother's house to visit her each night. Our property has two houses on it, a big one and a little one close together. And my grandma lived in the back. On windy nights, when I was waiting for my grandma to open the door to let me in, I would have this feeling that I was being watched. I don't know why, I would always look up at the roof. I had this feeling that there was something there. On the other side of the roof, just out of view, and that it knew I was here and was just about to walk over the ridge of the roof to look at me. I sometimes dreamed of the thing walking over the ridge and looking at me. It was just a silhouette but it had glowing white eyes. When I was a teenager, I had a friend who said she could see ghosts. Now, I don't believe in ghosts, and I always thought she said things like that to get attention. She told me stories about seeing the shadows of children in her house, and things like that. Well, the day I brought her to my house for the first time, we were in the backyard, and she looked up at the spot I used to be afraid of as a child. I never told anyone about it. She stared a good long while, and then said, There's something up there. What's up there? I asked. She said it was something waiting. For what? I asked. She said she didn't know, but that it was waiting to walk over the ridge of the roof to look at us. After another minute, she said, you should stop looking at that spot on the roof. I asked why, and she said, because it was never alive, and 
You mustn't look into its eyes. My grandmother is dead now, and my sister lives in the small house. I visit her now and then, but I never look up towards the thing on the roof, because I can feel it walking over the ridge when I'm not looking. The rainy season began in early summer, and June had been no exception. It did not surprise the man when he discovered rainwater dripping from his dining room ceiling. Shrugging it off, he placed a tall pot beneath the leak and expected it to stop on its own. However, it continued to rain, and before he knew it, the pot would threaten to overflow. He had to dump the water out first thing in the morning and straight after he returned home from work. Eventually, he began to notice water damage at the source of the leak. The white ceiling had discolored, turning a dull shade of brown. He checked the weather and realized that it would continue to rain sporadically over the next 10 days. The man was worried about the ceiling mildewing and becoming an expensive repair, so he called a local handyman. Unfortunately, the man could not sign to have the repairs done. Only his landlord could. It was a frustrating policy. The man called his landlord, but could not reach him. He left a few voicemails detailing how the damage was becoming progressively worse. The man was clueless as to why his landlord would not return his calls. They usually kept in touch, speaking at least twice a month. Finally, he reasoned that he would not be held accountable for any damages sustained. One night, the man was startled awake by a massive thump. He quickly turned on his bedside lamp and, just vaguely, he could see an overturned table and a large shape laying across it. He sprinted out of his apartment and called the police, gagging at the smell. The man sat in the police station with a blanket wrapped around his shoulders and a coffee mug resting in his hands. He did know one thing. There had been a dead body in his ceiling and the water had saturated it so badly that it caved under the weight. So far, the body was unidentifiable due to the rainwater and was being autopsied. While the man waited, he called his landlord and finally reached him, panicking as he explained the situation. His landlord was just as alarmed and the man pleaded for him to come to the station while he made his statement. The man paused as a detective crossed over to him and he lowered his phone, wondering if the body had been identified. His blood ran immediately cold and he shook his head with terror. The body belongs to Richard Thompson, his landlord, and he had died over a year ago. That's not what disturbed him the most. If his landlord was dead, then who was pretending to be him?
spend most of my Thursday nights driving. I drop the girl off at home, and then I go. I just go. I just go anywhere. I need those few small moments when I can feel completely free from everybody. There's a road that stretches around an old garden shop that my friends all worked at for a few years. It started just outside the south of the city, a little road that veered right so suddenly that I was doing 20 under the limit just so I could spot it in time. It led past the garden shop and straight into blackness. I've been on that road a few times with some other friends and I can predict most of the turns and stops far before I see them. As I left the light of the city, I flashed on my high beams and made the sudden right onto the road. I must have turned in too quickly. Gravel and dust filled the back window of my car, sort of a, a dark cloud that took away all light from the city behind me, just for a moment. The tires lost traction, and I start to veer into the ditch, fortunately saving myself with only inches to spare. Now, my little Toyota is not the best thing for dirt roads, but it's enough to get what I want out of it. The road stretches far beyond my sight, fading into a chilling darkness. It has a few houses, small farmlands and barns strewn along it, each with their own twisting paths. The trees above loom over, cracking all the light coming from the sky above. Long branches stretch towards the ground, like long fingers pointing. I pick up more and more speed as the road starts to straighten out, watching the edge of my headlights guide my way to a tranquil place, far beyond the worries of mine or any others. Up on the lip of a hill is a spot that overlooks the city, a popular place for many of the teenagers here in the South End. Often seen with many couples <laughs> solidifying their nights and the occasional group of stoners who like to simply watch things. The road leads up to this place, curving right until the top is reached. As I climb it, I can already see the taillights of four or five cars already up there, all minding their own business. I see a darker road, far less traveled upon, emerge on my left, avoiding the city watches. I've never seen this road before, but I figure that if I have a full tank and stay one hour within the city, yeah, what the hell. Might be worth my while to see something I haven't seen before. This road runs directly west and is completely straight, with no houses, farms or barns peppered along its curb. Even the trees have disappeared, opening up the view to a vast farmland with hills on both sides of the road, just cutting off the sight of any further land. Perfect. I stay on this road for a long time. My iPod is on shuffle, and much of the music is hitting all the right notes I want to listen to, mostly that of Led Zeppelin. Uh, there's nothing like blasting stairway to shut out all the noise outside. It must have been 20 minutes before I started to worry. The hills on both sides of the car have grown so close to the road that they have turned into walls, blocking any sight around me. A tiny valley that seems to stretch into infinity. I figured I should just turn around and come back the way I came. I didn't make any turns, so it should be easy for me to follow it all the way back. So I pulled over 
and made a U-turn. I even signaled for it. I don't know why I did, but for a second, that signal light caught something that stopped me in my tracks. It was tall and looked like a man, but it, it couldn't have. It could have been a bush that the shadows made to look taller, even thinner. I waited there for a few seconds with my headlights on that spot, but there wasn't anything. My car kicked into the highest gear and I was sailing. I wasn't going any faster than I needed to be since there are tons of deer that like to run out in front of things out here, but, well, fast enough that I was breaking the limit more than I was obeying it. From behind me, a light started to fill my mirror. I couldn't make out what it was at first, but it was definitely headlights, and they were coming closer. I start to slow down, but still keeping momentum in the case that it might be one of those highway rangers making the rounds on the deserted roads. But something told me that whoever this person was, they weren't carrying a badge. Closer and closer the car got, gaining on me like they were being chased by something. As the car became clearer, it zoomed past me in the oncoming lane, honking frantically. <laughs> it could be a couple of kids out for a kegger, but I don't know. It didn't really alarm me until I look in the rear view again. Behind me was a face with no features, pale as paper, staring at me. It didn't move, didn't even react to the bumps on the road. It was just there, like a picture on a screen, staring back at me. I was so frightened that I almost lost control of my car, drifting into both the left and right lane as I tried to grasp myself. I looked behind me and there was nothing not a single thing. The air hung fuller than before, almost damp, and every breath filled my lungs with a thick, moist air. It was the same thing as earlier from the turning signal. I'm terrified. I pushed down hard on the gas, starting to speed past untouched places on my speedometer. I begin to wonder if this is what the other person was running from, and if they got out. Then I see a dim red light ahead of me, the other car. This time it's going slower, almost a cruising speed. I don't know if they think they're okay, but if it just got to me, then it's most certainly able to get to them. I start to honk frantically at the car as I speed past it in the oncoming lane. It doesn't move. I look in my rear view again, and then I see something. Not it, but me, driving the other car. I start to feel an upset feeling in my stomach, like I'm about to throw up. That couldn't have been me. It couldn't have. I shake my head to compose myself and put the road back into my view. My eyes cleared, and the headlights behind me disappear into the blackness. I'm finally out of this, and I could start to see the hills spread apart to where they were in the beginning. I let out one laugh at the situation and rub the sleep from my eyes. When I open them again, the thing is stood in front of my car dark and hunched over, staring back at me with the same non-existent eyes. My wheels catch on the gravel as I try to avoid it and I run full speed into the ditch, 
flipping the car over. I begin to think about why I chose this road. <laughs> there could have been any other. I crawl out of the wreckage with as much strength as I have left. And just before I fall asleep, a Toyota is driving down the road. I just came, blasting stairway to heaven. I didn't even bother to scream. I love myths, urban legends, paranormal stories, and chronicles of unexplainable mysteries and phenomena. As a kid, I actively sought books and articles on the topic, no matter how vaguely related. Twenty years on, I still enjoy delving into the stories of the unknown. The difference being, twenty years ago, I didn't have access to the wonderful World Wide Web. These days, I literally have a world full of myths, legends, and stories at my fingertips. And so, I often indulge in long Googling sessions, dedicated to absorbing as much information as I can. I am intrigued by the unknown. It means that there are things yet to be discovered and mysteries to be solved. It was during one of my many mystery binges I came across the story of the Hat Man, a form of shadow person. I stumbled across the legend of the shadow people completely by accident, clicking through random links on Wikipedia. But it was the related article about the Hat Man which piqued my interest greatly. It roused a long dormant memory from within the depths of my mind. The following is an account of my encounter with what I now believe to be the Hat Man. I don't recall how old I was, around four or five, but it must have been quite late at night. My parents had retired for the night and the house was completely dark. The only source of light was the gentle wash of moonlight filtering through the thin curtains into my room. I was lying on the top bunk of the bunk bed my dad had made for us. The bottom bunk was occupied by my younger sister who had been sleeping soundly for hours. It was nearly Christmas, and I was laying awake, pondering the complexities of the world, something that has become a bit of a habit over the years. Although, it was likely the huge intricacies I was trying to figure out in my mind had something to do with how long it was until Christmas on that particular night. As I was staring at the ceiling, completely merged in my own thoughts, I suddenly became aware of a feeling spreading through my body. A chill went up the back of my neck, making my hair stand on end. If I'd been close to falling asleep, I was wide awake now. I held my breath and laid stone still, straining to hear something which would give me a clue as to what it was that had put me on edge so suddenly. I heard nothing other than my sister's rhythmic, deep breathing from the bed below. When I could hold my breath no longer, I let it go as quietly as I possibly could. I couldn't hear anything out of the ordinary, so, after a few more minutes of laying as still as possible, I decided to roll onto my side, so I could see out of the bedroom door into the hallway. I did this in such a way that it would seem, to anyone looking in on me, as though I was rolling over in my sleep. 
just in case one of my parents came in and gave me an earful for not being asleep as I was supposed to be. As I completed my expert maneuver, I heard a noise in the hallway. It sounded like footsteps, which was a relief. It was just my dad checking on something in the house. But as the footsteps drew nearer to my bedroom door, a wave of unease washed over me again. My dad was always very careful about being as quiet as possible when walking around after lights out, so as not to wake anyone. Listening to this particular set of footsteps, I wondered if perhaps this was my mum, as the perpetrator seemed to be making no attempts to mask their sounds. I pondered this curiosity as a figure emerged from the hallway and came to a stop in the doorway of my bedroom. Once again, I found myself holding my breath, trying to be as still as possible. The figure stood in the doorway, breathing quite loudly. It was definitely a man, judging by the sound of the breathing. For a few moments, I relaxed, thinking that it was my dad after all. I started breathing again and closed my eyes, pretending to be asleep. But the sound of the breathing stayed in the doorway. I opened my eyes again and took in the image before me. My blood ran cold. My dad did not habitually linger in doorways. Also, my dad was nowhere near as tall as the doorframe, nor did he wear or even own a wide-brimmed hat. I stayed as still as I could, hoping that the figure could not see that I was awake. With that monologue running through my mind, I was reminded of the line from the Christmas Carol. He sees you when you're sleeping, he knows when you're awake. I smiled to myself. The figure in the doorway was Santa Claus, and he was waiting for me to fall asleep. <laughs> of course, it made sense, being so close to Christmas. I closed my eyes once more, ready to fall asleep. Once more, I got that feeling of unease. The hairs on my neck stood on end once again. Something was not quite fitting about that conclusion. Santa doesn't wear a wide-brimmed hat. Also, I was fairly certain that he's never depicted as tall and broad-shouldered. The figure in the doorway definitely did not look or feel very Santa-ish at all. My eyes shot open again. I needed to figure out who was standing in the doorway. Even with the light filtering in through the curtains, I could not make out any details of the figure. My eyes had adjusted fairly well to the darkness by now, and I could make out just about everything around this figure. But whoever was standing in the doorway may as well have been a shadow. The only thing that told me that this was not a shadow was the heavy breathing accompanying the figure. Just as I felt that I could not lay still any longer, the shadowy figure took one last deep breath and receded from the doorway, seeming to melt away into nothingness. By this stage, a lot of kids would probably have cried out for their parents or, at the very least, thrown their covers over their heads. I did neither of these things. Instead, I laid there, pondering my new mystery of the night, Christmas forgotten until I fell asleep. I remember asking both of my parents the next day whether they'd spent any time looking in on my sister and me the night before. They assured me, every time that I probed them about it, that they had not been anywhere near my bedroom the previous night. I guess, after a while, I just sort of shrugged it off. It didn't happen again at all. Every now and then, 
the memory would spring to mind, especially during my nighttime ponderings. However, I thought about it less and less as time went on, until I saw the picture accompanying the Wikipedia article on the Hat Man. I'd almost forgotten about it completely. To this day, I have no idea what it was, whether it was one of my parents sleepwalking, somebody who wasn't meant to be in the house, a supernatural being, or otherwise. But the picture of the hat man is almost exactly what I remember in my doorway.